Happy April. Welcome. We are back here at Time in Your Kitchen. We have a little bit of a different view this evening. We have the store here at Time in Your Kitchen where you can get all kinds of great kitchen gear. I've got things here. I know that's super useful. Um, and tonight we are making handmade pierogies, a Jaeger schnitzel, and sauteed cabbage. I know I've been thinking about this meal for at least a week now. Very excited to, to try it. Very excited to see how it's made. As always, if you have any questions, go ahead and put those in the chat and I will ask Chef Garen as we go along. So without any further ado, I will allow Chef Garen to take over. Thanks. Hi there, everybody. Um, I guess let's get started. The first thing I want to do is our dough. So let's switch cameras. All right, everybody. So to get us started here, I think one of the first things that I want to do, if you have followed your prep sheet, you should already have your potatoes peeled and chopped up and in a pot covered with water. What I'd like you to do is to take that pot, put it onto a burner and activate it. If you have flames, just make sure the flames are underneath the pot, not reaching up around the sides. We're gonna bring those potatoes to a boil so that we can commence to turn them into filling for pierogies. Now, right here, uh, and underneath, we're going to turn on our stove at about 325 degrees. This will be for holding our schnitzel after we fry them. So with that done, let's begin making the dough for our pierogies. We're gonna do them here inside of a bowl. You can also do this uh, inside of a stand mixer with a dough hook attachment, but it's just as easy to do by hand. It doesn't require very much kneading. So right here, I have that pound and two ounces of flour. Um, those of you who don't have a kitchen scale, I gave the measurements of about four cups. Now, what I'd like you to start with, if you're using a volumetric measurement using cups, um, I'd like you to start with about three and a half cups, and we'll work in more flour from there so that we can be more accurate to the texture. If you go straight for the four cups, it's a possibility due to compression, but you'll have an inaccurate amount of flour, and you'll actually have more flour than you need. So, if you weigh it, it's going to be nice and easy for you. Right now, we're going to put a little bit of salt into our flour, about a teaspoon worth. Drop that right in. Then we're gonna take a whisk and we're going to whisk that salt into the flour. This whisk is like um, running the flour through a sieve. It's like sifting the flour. It's about 75% as effective. It'll help get that salt nice and spread through the flour. Now, right here in this cup, I have an egg and the sour cream for the recipe. What you're going to need to do is you're going to have to complete a cup and a half worth of liquids with this quarter cup of sour cream in the egg. Uh, if you don't put them into the same cup as the water you're about to fill it with, you'll end up with an accuracy because every egg is slightly differently shaped and sized. All that's really important is that you have about a cup and a half worth of liquid to work with. So I'm just filling this baby up to the cup and a half mark. If you don't have a two cup measure, you can use a one cup measure. Just make sure you put everything at one point into the same container. So you have an even cup and a half. Just trying to be nice and accurate there. Oh, still a little high, just a little bit more gone. Okay, there we go. So right here, we're going to take our liquids and we're going to run a fork or a whisk through them, help break up that egg and that lovely sour cream that's inside of there. This will help us make a nice tender dough. There we are. I'm gonna pour that right there into the flour, right in the middle. Then, Using this here rubber spatula, we're going to mix all of these ingredients together. So starting from the edge, just start pushing everything into the middle and turning your bowl. Continuing to scrape down the edge and whenever everything begins to form into a ball for us, it's when we're gonna start using our hands. It'd be best if the moisture were fully absorbed before you start kneading by hand though, because it could be rather sticky otherwise and you'll end up pulling some of that away with your hands. It'll get very badly stuck to you. You'll have to scrape. And once you have this loose shaggy mixture without too many wet spots, 
when we're gonna scrape down the side there. And then we can begin to mix this around by hand. So what we're gonna do, start moving it around inside the bowl, folding it in and pushing on it to get it to accumulate all this extra flour. It will be sticky, it will stick to you at first. It'll become less sticky. Now, for those of you who are doing this in volumetric measurement, if you can't touch your dough like this without it completely sticking to your hands, I want you to throw in that extra half of a cup worth of flour, um, but consider doing it in increments, maybe about half at first and then the other half, if it doesn't come together like this. It'll stick slightly to you, but not so much that you're coming away with the whole dough ball every time you're pressing on it. And you're just gonna knead it inside of the bowl here. Just like this, fun, messy work. And you're gonna keep kneading it till we have a pretty well cohered ball of dough. Not any loose cracks or anything around the edges or flour that hasn't been absorbed. And if it feels too sticky to you, even after you've added the full four cups, which is rather unlikely, but if it's still too sticky for you, you can continue adding flour by the tablespoon till it's a little less aggressive. There we go. Every now and then you might have to fold over a spot or two, but keep on moving the dough inside of this bowl, just like I'm doing, I'm pressing on it and flipping it over. There we go. And as you mix, you'll notice it will become a little stickier. It should be kind of sticky, but if it's a pool in the bottom of the bowl, that's not the sticky I'm talking about. Something that you can actually play with in your hands like this. Would you say that's like a Play-Doh consistency? Softer, softer definitely than Play softer than Play-Doh and significantly more sticky. Getting it to collect all the little bits off your fingers can sometimes pose a slight challenge. There we go. No, it's just that little touch sticky for me, just a little bit sticky to the point where I can't knead it anymore. So that's what I'm going to grab just about a tablespoon of flour, not much more. I'm going to continue to knead it around this bowl till it absorbs that flour as well. In total, you'll probably have about five minutes worth of kneading. And I can already feel this dough ball getting more silky, more smooth, not as many lumps inside of it as the lump pieces of flour begin to absorb moisture. There we go. Very handleable dough. And after a while, when you notice the dough doesn't look so darn lumpy, and it seems to kind of smooth itself out every time you press on the bowl, that's when it might be time for us to wrap it with some plastic and let it sit for a minute while we move on to our next little task. is a little sticky, but just feeling it, it's easy to handle, easy to form, and doesn't come away with my hand. Notice I can push on it, just like that. That should be enough kneading for us, as it's not an Italian pasta dough, we're not going to knead it super hardcore, but we are going to wrap it in some plastic and let it sit for a little bit right behind us. Okay, I see Jeremy is kneading that dough. I see him getting into it. Looks like Bridget's also kneading some dough here. There we go. And take a moment to wash that extra dough off of your fingers. It sticks in the fingernail area. It's pretty good. So Bridget's is very sticky. So I guess add some more flour to that. Get some more flour in there, Bridget. 
If you've used the full four cups, go for tablespoons at a time. Little tiny bits of uh, inaccuracy in measurement when making pasta doughs can really create significant differences in how handleable the dough is, specifically because there's so little moisture in it compared to flour. Because of that, you want to get as accurate as you can. And usually a dough ball that clears the bowl of all of its flour and doesn't stick to you firmly is pretty good for pasta. I'll let you catch up there for a moment. And those of you uh, who are ready for the next step, grab your pork cutlets. Remove their packaging. Now these are just boneless pork chops. And what we're also going to need is a little bit of seasoning. So what I do is I'm going to take some garlic here, some black pepper, and some salt. Small container here, and then equal amounts of each. We'll grab some garlic. Some salt, some black pepper. Remove those from your way. Mix that mixture together right here. All right, grab out your meat mallet. Now that dinging's just telling me that my oven has gotten to 325. So just a reminder, make sure you've preheated your oven. And if you get a chance, grab a baking sheet and you can line it with some foil or parchment. Or if you don't feel like, uh, if you don't worry about scrubbing later, you can leave it there, it's okay. Uh, but grab yourself a small baking sheet. You'll need that so we can put those down into the oven. And we are going to take these individual cutlets here and we're gonna lay them in the middle of our cutting board. We won't need the knife quite yet. You're gonna need a meat mallet. Now, the side of the meat mallet I prefer is actually the flat side. You can't use the spiky side if you're gonna use some plastic wrap over the meat, uh, specifically because it'll mash all of that plastic wrap into your meat. But if you only have a meat mallet with a spike side, just don't cover your meat with plastic wrap like I'm about to do. So just take a nice big square. There we go, just like that. And with the flat side of your mallet, just gonna pound it out. Now, it's gonna be a little noisy in here for a moment, probably at your place as well. If you put a towel under the board, it might do some of your noise. Uh, but we're gonna pound this out till it's about half as thin, about a quarter of an inch. Essentially, this whole um, thing will probably double in size, if not more. Uh -oh. be rough with it. If you're looking over at your potato pot and it's starting to bubble like mine is right now, you might want to remove the lid because starchy things tend to overboil with a lid on. Just helps them get up to a boil swifter though when, when it's on there. So pound these puppies nice and flat. I'm gonna lose my seasoning. <laughs> Pork chops already dead. It can't feel a thing. Now keep the plastic wrap intact. What I'm going to have you do: peel it back, give yourself a sprinkling of some seasoning on one side, put it back on the plastic. This plastic will help you store it. What I do is I just grab it, I lay it on the plastic just like this. You can season the other side. Then I set it off to the side and I go for another. Now there is one more little thing that really helps. And before I put this off to the side, I want to show you. See this seam of fat that goes around the side? There is a bit of silver skin in there. It looks like this. That can be kind of tough. And because it shrinks whenever it cooks, it'll make the meat curve which will make it difficult for it to cook because it won't be flat. What you're going to have to do is take a nice sharp knife and right around the edges where you feel that little seam of silver skin, give it two little slits. It should go all the way through. It'll actually be a little tough, 
uh, which is how you'll know you're cutting through the silver skin. This will keep it from curving so badly whenever we go to cook it. So now for the next pieces. Lay a piece flat, grab a new piece of plastic wrap if you're using that other piece to hold the piece of meat. Pound her out. Now, if you're a little more old world than I, you might use a piece of maybe flour sack towel to cover this meat. No shame in that. You're going to have to bleach it pretty good when you're done. Nice and flat and thin, just like before, peel up, give it a little seasoning, slit the silver skin in two places right around that exterior fat ring, assuming that you have one on your cutlet. Could you trim the fat off of this if you wanted to beforehand? You can, but I don't recommend it. It's actually really good to be there for flavor and you won't notice when it's fried quite a lean piece of pork too. Mm. Usually coming from, you know, like the loinish kind of area. Let's see here. Last piece, at least for me. I don't know how many you're doing at home. <laughs> Some of you are cooking for families. You have to make a few more, but usually though the pieces look rather small. Um, one piece is typically good enough to Eat an adult, assuming they don't have really big appetites. If they have big appetites, might need a couple of things. Do have a question. Mm -hmm. I'm using chicken tenders. Is that okay? Of course it is. Pounding them flat, you'll have to be kind of gentle. There's a shiny side on the chicken tender and a side that's kind of rough looking for most of them. Make sure that shiny side's up when you pound on them so they don't completely fall apart, but they will have to be uh, rather skinny. So if, uh, if you find pounding them out to be too difficult, consider filleting them in half. That way they'll get nice and thin. Let's get the seasoning on this bad boy. right around where his outside was, was right around here. I'm gonna put a nice deep slit there because the silver skin drifted a little bit. There we go. Then we can flip her over. Give it the last bit of seasoning and last slit. Just like that. Set that off there to the side for a moment. Let's make ourselves a little egg wash. A pretty simple egg wash here. Crack in one egg. If you're in the habit of cracking your egg on the side of the bowl, get out of that habit. Whenever you crack an egg on the side of the dish, uh, you're likely to break that lovely little uh, membrane that holds together the egg white. And whenever that happens, it's going to likely fall into your bowl. Better to use a flat surface on the side. Then we're gonna need a whisk. We're gonna need a little bit of mustard. Now I suggested brown mustard. You can use Dijon mustard, or in my case, I'm using a whole grain of brown mustard, just because I had it around. As long as it's not yellow. Yellow is probably a bit too much for this dish. Plop in a little bit of brown mustard. If you want to be heavy about it, you can use more than I suggested. It's okay, it's a tasty thing. We're gonna beat these two together real quick. There we go. And then add about a cup of water. Cold from the sink is just fine. There we go. Now, since my egg wash is done, I'm going to take just a quick moment. I'm gonna test my potatoes. Now, I know my potatoes are done whenever they fall apart easily. It's called fork tender. 
If you poke a potato pretty well, it's gonna feel tender to that fork. But if it falls apart when you do that, then that potato is done. It needs to fall apart pretty good. If anything, and you're really you know, um, concerned about your potato not being soft enough, which is important, uh, just set it off to the side for a moment, break off a little piece and eat it. It should be as soft as a baked potato. Uh, everything should fall apart in your mouth. It shouldn't have any kind of uh, intense uh, texture to it. So there is our egg wash. Right here are our dredges. Uh, this here is some plain breadcrumb. Uh, you can use Italian seasoned breadcrumb because it's quite common and I get that. However, since we're making a Central European dish, the seasonings in Italian breadcrumb aren't quite conducive to our dish. So it's best you use something completely plain. It can be cracker meal, breadcrumb, or even panko. Uh, all of those will work. You're going to need a nice wide skillet, at least 10 inches, because uh, otherwise you're going to be pretty much frying these one piece at a time. Um, and you're going to paint it with some oil. Now, when I say paint, I don't mean just a splash. You need almost like a quarter of an inch worth of oil. You're kind of shallow frying. We're going to turn that pan on so it gets nice and hot for us. It'll take a couple of minutes. So be patient. And what you can do is you can actually bread these completely and even set them off to the side for a moment before they go into the fryer. So let's begin. In fact, you're gonna want a kind of motion. So what we're gonna do here is we're going to go flour, egg wash, breadcrumb. Take your piece of pounded out schnitzel. In case you were curious, Jaeger schnitzel actually means hunter's cutlet. Schnitzel means cutlet. It can refer to veal, pork, or poultry, um, but the way it's prepared specifically being pounded out very thin is kind of the word for the game. You're gonna press it into that flour, flip it over and do the same on the other side. Then take the whole piece, let it go for a swim, but make this a short journey, a little swim, not a long one. You want it to keep most of that flour on it. And then right into your breadcrumb, start pressing. And flip. If much like me, your pans are a little tinier than what you're crumbing with. You'll have to be have to be a little careful to keep from making the kitchen a mess. There we go. Press on both sides. You've effectively breaded this cutlet. So what I'm going to do, because my oil is just a moment away from being hot, is I'm going to set this cutlet right back on the plastic wrap from whence it came, and then set that off to the corner, and then begin breading another cutlet. See how big these bad boys are? We'll be lucky if we get two into this skillet at a time, but it's okay. We have the oven to hold things as they come down. So it would seem that I've been breading things in the wrong order this uh, whole time. Personally, I've always done egg, then flour, then the other thing, but I can see where this would make a lot more sense. Because you'd have to dip an egg again for, yes. the, for the bread crumb to stick. Yes. You can do that. It makes a thicker crust going around the outside. Hmm. But given the way that we're going to cook this and how flat this is, it could end up making the crust wave too much, and then it could just fall straight off. It is kind of a deli cr delicate crust. It has a tendency to fall off anyway if it sits for a while after you've plated it or after you've pulled it out of the skillet. Press around. If there are any corners that didn't get that breadcrumb, get some on there. You know, pick it out from underneath the meat, press it onto the top, however you got to to get it nice and well filled. There we go, set this puppy right down there. My last piece. Press it into my flour. Both sides. You can see the importance of seasoning before you do this, because even if you put your own seasoning and things into the breadcrumb, the likelihood of all of those seasonings really staying on the meat is pretty low. Uh, and much of it will actually stay inside of the dredging material. So you have to be careful and make sure you season your meat before doing this, any kind of meat that you happen to be breading. It's up there. Press. But before you might have to reach under the meat a little bit, slap some on top so you can press it on. Be effective 
and consistent. There we are. All on. Nice and breaded boneless pork chop. There we go. Set that right to the side there, like this. Gonna wash some of this coating off my fingers because they're just as breaded as the schnitzel right now. And we're gonna test another tater. And if you have a wet finger, go like this. Oh, we got a hot skillet. It's happened. Yeah. Barbara asks, what if you put seasoning in the flour? Uh, much of it will remain inside of the flour. You'll have to season the flour so intensely that it really won't make much of a difference. Always season the meat because it's contact with the meat means that it will stay on the meat. It's underneath all of that breading. and It'll help make the flavor nice and strong. So now that I know this baby's actually popping in a sizzling, I now know I can take a piece of meat, lay it straight down inside of there. Now this is a 12 inch skillet. It's a pretty big skillet. So I can probably get two of there. Now, as long as the meat doesn't overlap on itself or curl up the sides of your pan, you're good to go. If your skillet isn't hot enough, when you lay down a piece and it doesn't bubble, your, your uh, coating will literally sluice right off. So make sure your skillet is hot first. That little bit of a touch of water as I just did there, even just cutting off a piece of meat, laying it inside to see how it bubbles will help you determine whether or not it's gotten there. I'm gonna remove my dredging materials. See, check in the chat here. Kimberly says, never knew that. I always put the seasoning in the flour when I bread things. You can as well, just, just make sure that you use a heck of a lot of seasoning if you want it to reach through. That's the reason they make seasoned breadcrumb to begin with. It just takes a heck of a lot more seasoning to get there. My potatoes aren't quite there yet, though yours might be getting there. I'm going to grab my, my colander right now, put it into my sink, because I know I'm going to need it soon. So one colander into my drainer. There we go. You're going to need a pair of tongs. Now what you're going to do is you're going to have to kind of play your oil like a fiddle. The temperature is really important. Um, if the temperature gets too hot, you're going to start singeing your breadcrumb. Breadcrumb burns very easily. So you're going to want to take a pair of tongs and peek under the meat every so often. And also keep in mind, the outer ring of your skillet is cooler than the inner ring. So things in this region are going to cook faster than out here. At some point, it will be necessary for you to turn the whole piece. Be swift and gentle at the same time because you don't want to rip off your lovely coating. Try to find a good area underneath that you can grab it quickly so we can flip flop it around. And once the first side gets nice and golden, it'll take two to three minutes. Then we flip it over from one side to another. And then of course that same 180 degree turn These last few minutes are important for potatoes. You don't necessarily want them falling apart to the point where they turn into mashed potatoes instantly. When potatoes overcook, they take on a lot of extra water. And if your filling is too runny, that won't be so great. But as I said earlier, it still has to be rather tender. It's gotta fall apart. I'm gonna grab my baking sheet. I should you. You can line it if you wish. I love parchment. Nothing sticks to parchment. Almost everything that cooks will at some point stick to foil. Uh, that's a reality of foil. If you have a non-stick baking sheet, don't worry about it. Just shove it right on. And once again, your oven should be preheated to about 325 degrees. And be patient. Oh, those cutlets look good.
So this is more of a Central European, not so much Eastern European. It's a Bavarian dish, to be specific. So very German. Okay. So most of the Central European cultures have their version of this. And when when you're born in America and raised in America, many of your families made this under many guises and names. But it's always been a schnitzel. You just didn't know it. All right, I think I'm ready. Let's take a peek here. Let's do a flip. Nice and golden. Look at that. Flip number two. Patience and perseverance made a bishop of his weapon. How are we doing in the kitchen? Lindsay, how you doing? Just a thumbs up, thumbs down. How are we? Oh, we got a thumbs up from Lindsay. Bridget, I see Jeremy's at the stove there. Now those cook down a little bit inside. They do shrink up just a little bit, which is why it was necessary to put those little slits along the edges, because when the outside begins to shrink, the whole baby would curl. And if it curls like in here, it's not going to make full contact with the pan, mm. and then it's not going to cook at all in the middle. No. That's a little secret I didn't learn till much later in the game. Not even my mama knew that secret. Just wondered why the schnitzel kept on curling on it. <laughs> and it's just that little bit of skin there. My temperature is pretty high. I'm seeing blackening on some of my uh, some of my little bits of breadcrumb that are gathering around the edges. Uh, if you want to keep using this for more schnitzel, it's important that you keep that temperature mediated. So turn it down a little bit if you're starting to see that, and flip her around. Time for that half turn. Now, what many people don't know, and this is just a fun little fact, is that pork's doneness temperature is lower than poultry and beef. Uh, reason being, there aren't things inside of pork typically uh, that can harm you, that can survive over about 145 degrees. And that includes things like worms. Those parasites have a pretty low te temperature threshold. So in around 145, pork products like this are actually completely done. Pork chops, there's two methods when it comes to making pork chops. There's low and slow, so it gets good and tender and falls apart. And then there's pounding it thin and cooking it rather swiftly. This is the latter of which. You don't want to cook it too, too long or too, too hard. Because otherwise, the pork chops can get rather tough making it this way. Playing that oil like a fiddle, as I said, I'm turning my heat back up again because I see a diminishing of bubbling. And I want to keep good bubbles. I'm gonna check my potatoes again. Better safe than sorry. Check your potatoes too if you got a moment. Now see how the potato won't fall off my fork? It's not there yet. But close, we're close. So if the potato goes through the fork, um, I believe you're good, you're good to go? I'm ready to pull. So if the potatoes go through the fork, Right? Is that a question, the, Jeremy? The fork will go through the potato, but if the yeah. potato doesn't fall off the fork, it's likely not tender enough. Okay, so I'm good. All right. And if you really have to question, pull the whole potato out, put it on the cutting board so it cools for a moment, and then eat it. If it's tender enough for you to squish around in your mouth, it's tender enough for us to mash into our pierogi filling. So I'm going to do my last, my last cutlet here. And from the tiny little pieces of meat those looked like, they're now actually quite sizable. If you have a moment and you have a little bit of a mess going on from earlier, it's a good time to wipe it up a little bit. Cross-contamination can't happen amongst things that are about to be cooked, but when they're already cooked, it can become a problem. Yeah. 
I'm so uh, obsessed about removing those little splashes. I hate those little splashes. I know whenever my husband fries things, there's always hand towels, the, the kitchen towels lining everything around our stove. <laughs> just to keep the little splashes It's a preparative off. measure. It's like putting down paper for a puppy. It is. <laughs> so since this guy's in the middle, no need for turning. He's all by himself. He's got a little time. It's a very big piece. I can tell by some of the edges on my potato beginning to not look so sharp and my potatoes have softened. If uh, some of you, whenever you were peeling and cutting your potatoes, you might note that cutting them to an even sizing uh, is really helpful because it makes them cook at the same rate. If they're too chunky or too small, they'll cook at different rates and then they'll fall apart on you before they Really get a chance to tenderize. Chance to tenderize. Let me see here. I think I, I had a potato just a moment ago. I stabbed it. Oh, almost. Let me see. Oh, that's that's going to be the question. Now, this is the kind of moment when I literally do this and remove the mask. I snip it first because that's just you know good for you. Yeah. Potato of truth. After done potato, my dear. All right. Okay, so what we're gonna do, put my mask back on as I munch my little potato. Oh no, Lindsay's haven't even started boiling yet. It's okay, just keep an eye on what we're doing and you'll have an easy time finishing this up later whenever we're not on the same subject. However, I'm going to wait to make this filling anyway until I can get a few other things prepared. Now, once you've taken all of the potatoes out of this pot, refill the pot. We're gonna put it right back on the stove. Let those potatoes cool off in your sink for a bit and drain. That extra moisture isn't gonna be helpful to making our filling. Barbara says her friend is learning to make a gluten-free dough for her pierogi. Hey, that works. Whatever works for you. Using different flours, it can happen, but without gluten accumulation, the flour doesn't stretch very easily. So you'll just have to be very tender and delicate with your dough whenever you go to roll it out. There we go. And I already have the other two schnitzel I cooked in the oven on the pan. When I remove this bad boy, I'm just going to put it right in there with its friends to chill for a bit while we finish up some other things. Oh, those are hot handles. Send the last piece behind. Ooh. <laughs> So right here, pot of water. Don't salt it yet. It's going to be for boiling our pierogi. But if you didn't know, you don't salt the pot until it's already boiling. What's that? You have a question over there? No, nope, just pointing to you. <laughs> Trying some different camera angles. Oh, okay. You're going to wipe for one second. All right, I just need to get my lid back. So I can pop it on this. It'll help it boil a little faster. But get that puppy hot for me. We're going to need it. We're almost done here with my schnitzel. Check back in on the schnitzel cam. The schnitzel cam. The schnitzel cam. Oh, forever it shall be done so. <laughs> so my last schnitzel is complete. I'm going to take this little guy, I'm going to carefully try to get under it so I can hold him firmly. Let him drip off for a moment. And then right Onto my tray with a spread. Just like so. Let them all sit together, do their thing. 
Gonna remove this whole skillet out of the way. All right. Next, we will begin working on forming our filling. Grab a nice mixing bowl and a masher. Now, you can do this several ways. You can blend together your filling in a food processor. You can blend your food, uh, your filling together using a spoon uh, after having used a potato ricer to mash your potatoes. You can even use a hand mixer, you know, the typical electric kind with the two beaters in it. All of those will work, but this is the simplest way to do this, honestly. Just a good old potato masher. Right here, we're gonna take the potatoes, we're gonna put them right here into the bowl. We're going to season the potatoes. I chose, I use white pepper particularly for this dish. You can see its color is lighter than typical black pepper. Um, its flavor is a little dustier and earthier um, and a little sour smelling compared to typical bright lemony black pepper. Um, but you can use simple black pepper or no pepper at all. It's up to you. I'm gonna give mine a little touch here. Many times you'll find your white and black peppercorns are actually mixed together. Um, it's a very English thing to do. And uh, the two actually complement each other very nicely, which is the reason for that. A little bit of onion powder here. Now, as I mentioned in your recipe, you can make any flavor profile. Use the recipe as a base, but then where it says one to two cups of other ingredients, that's where you get to play. Bacon, broccoli, sauerkraut, all kinds of things can go inside of there. And they taste really, really good with potatoes. Just about anything you can think of will literally stuff into a pierogi, but by the time you start getting to meat fillings and ricotta cheese, it turns into a ravioli at that point. I need a good pinch of salt. And I think a lot like you were saying, the, the schnitzel, a lot of cultures have it in some way, shape, or form. Mm -hmm. you know, a lot of cultures all have a different form of pierogi. We were talking about it at dinner the other night. You know, well, it, even just the Italian ravioli, the, the Chinese dumplings. Um, then it goes into the Spanish empanada. Mm -hmm. like everybody's got their own little form of a parcel dumpling kind of situation. Yes. So I mash this before I start mixing in the cheese. And I go for the cheese. Now I'm just going to do a cheddar version, but you'll still want for most pierogies to have a slightly cheese. Uh, oriented flavor in your filling. So that's why I always list cream cheese as one of the ingredients inside because it really does make it so. Uh, it gives it a good strong flavor with its tartness and its saltiness. So I have my cream cheese and my shreddy chatty. I'm just going to take that cheese and just gonna sprinkle it in, dump it all in there. And then as far as the cream cheese goes, I'm gonna break it up a little bit. Jeremy says uh, in Japan, it would be tonkatsu. Tonkatsu. <laughs> oh, the potato. Or gyoza. Such a, such a wonderful. Gyoza, wonderful shumai, vegetable. dim sum. I'm trying to think of all the different names I know for, for dumplings. Hmm. There's so many different names. <laughs> all right. So now we get the cheese in. Did anybody choose to do a, a different add-on into their filling? I wasn't sure if anyone took the bait on my recipes. Staying neutral. Okay, the cheese is kind of the quintessential. <laughs> and for those of us who have experienced Mrs. T's pierogies, you're about to outdo her. It's time for you to put those back in the freezer. Go for a good old homemade one. Barbara said she's had an apple-filled pierogi. Yep, fruit-filled pierogies and dessert pierogies are common, as well as plum mm. and dry, uh, dry cottage cheese. Dry cottage cheese, you could either just strain out the whey from your cottage cheese, but it's actually technically a variety of cheese that you can buy in different places. I need a rubber scraper because this here potato masher loves to hold on to everything I mash. So a little rubber scraping will help me keep myself moving along. Here we go. I 
I see now why this one was called the mix and match. <laughs> Once things are nice and squished up, your filling is ready. Keep that strainer handy. You're gonna need it after we boil our pierogies. There we go, just mixing it all together a little bit. Should have a nice uh, form here, it shouldn't flow. If anybody's flowing, I don't know. I don't know what to say, I don't know what you do. <laughs> but it should be pretty darn tacky and solid as a ball. If you don't end up using all of your pierogi filling, it's okay. Usually there's someone around who will gladly eat it right out of a bowl. So right here, I'll leave that off to the side. It's now time for us to pull out our pierogi dough again. Voila. Now it's had a chance to sit for a little bit. Because of that, it's absorbed a bit more of its moisture and it changes in texture slightly. Makes it easier to play with, that's for sure. You can see it's even smoother. And that's just because the flour is really getting a chance to take on all that lovely water. Beautiful. Plop, sort of put that down there. And we're going to need just a little bowl of flour, just like so. Put my filling off to the side. Now, this is an optional thing. If you're kind of uh, uh, detail oriented and you really want them to look well rounded on the edge, some of these biscuit cutters here will really help. Uh, we'll need a sizing between one of these three gauges. Going to get a little, little bit of flour down. Rub that in. And we're going to need a rolling pin. It's probably best if you have a wooden rolling pin with flour as well. Oh, I've never meant to be a gymnast. I hate rubbing things with flour. It's that texture. It gives me goosebumps. <laughs> so what we're going to do, get some of the excess flour off your fingers. Take a small sharp knife. I think my big knife might just be a little unwieldy in this circumstance. So a small paring knife. Pull up on the dough, just like so. And then just kind of cut a piece of the dough off. The piece of dough resulting should be about the size. Oh goodness, let me think about this. This is roughly a rounded tablespoon. But it should be about this size right here. I wish I had something that was a good comparison. Do I have a good comparison? Did you say a golf ball, ping pong yeah, ball? Definitely smaller than a golf ball. Definitely a little smaller than a ping pong ball. Does anybody out there online have a good reference for this size? It's, it's just, I'd say that it, across, it goes about an inch and a half. So if you have a measuring tape or anything that'll help you, that'll definitely help you. And then you need to form it into a smooth ball. So I'll show you this again really quick because I feel like I did it without mentioning it. But forming this into a smooth ball is rather simple. Cutting off another piece of dough, I kind of gotten used to this sizing. So for me, it's rather easy. For other people, I can understand where the sizing would be strange, but I, to make the dough ball smooth, I literally bring all the dough I can to one side. I scrunch it up and then I pinch. And what happens is the far side is a nice smooth little ball. And I rolled my hands just slightly and you have a perfect little ball. The rounder this ball is, the more round your casing is gonna be when you roll it out. So we have a pretty good overhead of exactly where my flowery spot is. Yes, Scott says good. a large marshmallow size. There you go, marshmallow. That's very close to a marshmallow, very correct. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take this ball of dough and I'm gonna roll it in a flower slightly so it gets nice and flowery, but not so much that it's like got caked flour on it. Try not to get it cakey. Then take your rolling pin and roll it in one direction and it'll become an oval, at which point you'll turn it around and roll it in the other direction. You're going to go until it is roughly four inches or so across, a circle that is four inches across. By switching it from side to side, you're gonna just keep creating an oval and turning it. And it's gonna make a relatively circular piece 
If it's not perfectly circular, don't worry about it. You'll see whenever you form it, it kind of fixes itself. So, sorry, I'm making long work of this one wrapper. So we have our piece here, relatively rounded, about four inches across. We're gonna need a tiny cup of water for sealing. Many people say that you have to use egg wash to seal, and that's complete falsehood. This is made of flour. All you have to do is take your finger and rub along half of the perimeter of this dough, just half of it, whether it's the side closest to you or farthest away is only dependent on how you're gonna fold it over because we're gonna fold these in half. I'm gonna take a, smooth, a spoon here. And when you rub this with water, you're gonna notice it gets nice and slick after you rub it for a moment. When it's slick and slimy like that, it's gonna seal like a dream. Take a nice spoonful dollop of this potato and kind of shape it into a small nugget Be, and keep it on the one side because you're gonna take the whole bit of pastry, you're gonna fold it all the way over. And then using your fingers, you're gonna press out all the air and seal the, the whole thing on, just like so. Keep pressing. You shouldn't press so hard that it literally like sticks to the board, but it has to cohere to itself. So make sure that it actually sticks together nicely there. And you have a good little shape just like this, one pierogi. Now, for those of you who don't like there to be too much lip on your pierogi, or if your lip is kind of weirdly shaped, this is where the biscuit cutters can come in. Find a biscuit cutter that is about the size of your pierogi, place it on the edges and press. It'll cut off that extra edge and you'll get a more neat looking pierogi. Super neat and tidy, just like that. So what you'll need to do is you'll either need an excess baking sheet or a cutting board somewhere at hand or just a, a, an empty area of countertop. Give it just a little bit of flour and that way you can start setting these puppies down. Wherever you set them, Make sure there's just a little flour on the surface because without it, they'll begin sticking as they sit there. So now is the real meat of our course here, my friends. No pun intended. We're going to begin rolling out pierogies. If you have people nearby, be them friends, children, or family members, tell them to peel their butt away from the TV and help you. <laughs> because <laughs> it takes a little while to roll these. So I'm actually going to keep, I'm gonna probably roll out a good like eight of these just so you guys can keep seeing how I do this because repetition is going to create a stronger bond and understanding with this particular dish. So just rolly roll, whenever it gets a little elongated, turn it around, the stuff starts sticking to your rolling pin, dust it off a little bit. If the wrap itself begins sticking to the tabletop, rub it around in your flour a little bit, don't be afraid. About how many pierogies do you think you'd get out of that dough? This batch here will easily make like two dozen pierogies and given their size, I would say probably more like 18 to 20 pierogies maybe specifically, but given their size, I usually fill up a person with like five or six pierogies. When they boil, <laughs> they swell as well, keep that in mind. Yes. So when you get a nice regularly round piece about four inches across is when you're gonna take half of the perimeter, rub it nicely with some water in your fingertip and rub it till it gets slippy. A little slimy there, and then we're ready. Take our spoonful of filling and put it on the one side. Don't overlap your, your seam though. You want that seal to come across and fold it all the way over. And then we're gonna poke all the way around. Make sure you're getting those air pockets out. Those air pockets actually burst sometimes whenever you put them into the pot. So make sure you're pressing them out. If you have to put it in your hands and go like this all the way around. And then once again, if you aren't a fan of having too much lip on your pierogi, take a biscuit cutter and cut off that little extra bit of lip. If you're desperate, you can use this dough later, but I call this rework. Once a dough has been rolled in flour and rolled out and played with a lot, it tends to get kind of tough and isn't easily usable again. However, instead of rolling out a large sheet of this all at once and just cutting them, I don't end up with very much waste. In fact, much less waste in this particular method. That's what Barbara just said. She said she's seen 
where people just lay it all out and, and start then cut cutting. it with the, you know, cut it out like cookies. Mm -hmm. But that would make sense to have a lot less waste. And, and like you said, you're, you're not reworking the dough. Yes. And if you have a couple of people to do this, what's really nice is that like you can kind of Lucy and Ethel it where one of you makes the casings and the other person fills and seals them for you. So you just do the rolling out part and then they do the, the part where they wet it, fill it and seal it. I know a big thing in the Youngstown area, especially during Lent, uh, a lot of the churches will get together and a lot of the, the older ladies of the church will come together and just be cooking pierogies and getting those ready for sales on Fridays for... Uh, Depending on your nationality, yes. it's either like cavatelles or pierogi. Mm -hmm. It's one or the other. Sometimes you get some Greek Orthodox people, it's baklava time. Oh, and I wouldn't say no to any of those. You get a little stanakopita and baklava on my day. Anything with phyllo, I'll take it. Yes. I'm feeling the phyllo. Oh. There we go, four inches across. Let's see. Let's see, is it Luis in there also cooking up? Hi. How's everybody doing? Are you feeling comfortable with, with this dough? Is this dough treating you nice? It can be a challenge, especially under the circumstances you don't have something flat to work with. However, a plastic cutting board like this with a moist towel under it will hold still for you well. And it'll hold flour nicely as well because of its texture. They make good rolling surfaces in the event that you don't have smooth countertops. I have tile and grout at home and I have to put things on top in order to be able to roll at home. And a typical silicon mat just doesn't do it. Be careful of overfilling. You can do it. I do it all the time because I can't be held back. Modesty <laughs> is difficult to learn. Moderation. <laughs> all in moderation. So you'll take your fingers all the way around and chop. Let's see. I think I would love to try this with a sweet potato filling and maybe like a brown butter sauce. Just be situation. careful with sweet potatoes. They're pretty okay. high moisture. The mm. reason I suggest russets is because they're lower moisture. Sure. With the sweet potatoes, you're going to bake them first. You're not going to boil them. Um, and then when it comes to the things you mix with, make sure they're very dry. Any extra moisture will make the filling too soft. So definitely not brown sugar in with that. That would be too... You could nice. get brown sugar in with the with the potato, yes, because it's it's a dry ingredient. But let's say if you were using something like a cooked vegetable, like some broccoli, you probably mm -hmm. wouldn't mix that with sweet potato. But you'd want to yeah. squeeze that out with a cloth uh, or a paper towel. Really make sure that excess moisture will remove. Sure. If I was trying to sneak more vegetables into a child's diet, put the broccoli and hide it in the pierogi. Hide it in the pierogi. You can even break down the broccoli with the food processor or or the mixer so that it really just becomes a piece of the mash and isn't its own, you know, textural entity. Because mm. I know children see those vegetables as evil, especially <laughs> with the texture. You know, I didn't think about it, but with the sweet potato idea, I feel like some nuts would go very well. Ooh, yes. I'd salt them though. I try to keep the sugar away because they're already so darn sweet. I don't put sugar on sweet potatoes. Sometimes squash, but sweet potatoes, I always find too sweet. Yes. To need any help. I remember having to make buckets of sweet potato butter in my last restaurant. Mm. And how much we went through was just wow. It was just butter and brown sugar, a little honey. But we went through a lot of it. So has everybody at least gotten to a point where they're caught up and they're they're starting to fill some pierogies? Are some of you still just mashing your filling? Has everybody fried their schnitzel? Got thumbs up from Jeremy. Luis is, is rolling out. I see the uh, the rolling pin there. Bridget as well. She's rolling. We're roll. Oh, we're all rolling here. Jer those are beautiful, Jeremy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they look like more like empanadas, but is it okay? <laughs> <laughs> you know, the two are folded quite similar, so understand. Okay. Oh, those look great. Those look great. Kimberly says she, she's doing good. She might be using too much dough and hers kind of look like empanadas as well. Marla yeah, be, says- Be the careful on that dough done. sizing. Make sure you don't have, you know, more than an inch and a half worth of diameter on your dough ball. Excellent. 
And if you have too much lip on the edge, that's where that round cutter really helps. You can even do it by hand with a knife if you're careful. If you're really careful. I'm good with a small knife. <laughs> I usually have a smaller rolling pin for this job. I left it at home. It's kind of a dowel rod. It's about this long. Usually involves one hand. Best way to go if you ask me. Even a child's rolling pin mm. can be really good for this job because you're making small circles. A smaller pin really helps. Oops, water first. See you there. Well, you know, you'll notice when I make my filling, it's not a circular ball anymore. Uh, it's, it's really not supposed to be because you kind of want it to be the shape that it's in whenever it's finished. If you go with a circular ball, especially if you put it in the middle, it'll make a really big lump in the middle. So you just want to be careful about that. Make sure that your filling is in the shape you want it to be when things are finished. Looks a little bit like a football, almost. I always see a little hat. Little hat? I can see a little hat. Little presses. Oh, excuse me. A big cup of chamomile tea before we started this. <laughs> After a couple of bubbles. I don't know if you caught that on the microphone. <laughs> the tiny baby boy. Oh, in the mask. <laughs> that is one thing I'll miss when we're not wearing masks anymore. That and not having to cut my beard so much. Mm. Now I like whenever the masks are gone, I'm gonna have to be trimming my mustache. Yeah, I'm keeping these for the winter. My <laughs> face just gets too cold. Mm -hmm. I have been asked several times why I'm still wearing my mask, and most of the time it was outside, and I was like, because it's cold out here. Yeah. Well, if you're like Ohio, we had that little bit of snow this morning that was melted by 10 a.m. So, so if it's me in the morning at Dollar General, it's because I didn't brush my teeth. Huh? Wow. Well, why do I smell like? <laughs> Who can argue that? A little safety for everyone. Mm. Nice and doughy. <laughs> I wish I could say a brush would make this easier, but it doesn't. You really do need to use your finger to do this. So you can feel that sliding part. Oh, oh, oh. It's not so full. There we go. Put it into shape. Get it in the side. Reach around. Feel it off. Make sure you got all those air pockets. Ceiling on the table is best though. The shape should be flat on one side and high on the other. Now these cook actually rather swiftly. They only take about three to four minutes. You can't use the floating trick though. Floating trick only works with those frozen store-bought ones. When they're float, when they float, they're done. Mm. That's because they're frozen in the center and there's absolutely no air inside. But given that you made these by hand, there's likely to be a little bit of air inside. And they're actually going to float pretty fast. So we like it when the gnocchi floats, but not your pierogi. Well, it, technically, with the gnocchi, it's the same way. They float for a little bit before they're done. But whenever you get the store bought ones, they say they're done when they float. Mm. Not the case with the homemade gnocchi. Now, Bridget asks, when you're rolling your dough ball, is it bouncing back or is it staying pressed? Now, the elasticity in some of your doughs may be kind of high, and that will actually make it shrink back a bit. In order to compete with that, it means you have to apply a little bit more pressure with your rolling pin, because as I'm rolling, you'll note it does kind of want to spring back to its original size. A perfectly normal circumstance. 
just means you need it very effectively or your dough had a pretty good gluten content. It creates more elasticity. But a good firm pressure. Well, uh because -huh, you can see it slowly drifting back into place after I roll. Rolling it slightly wider than you need it to be is a good way to prepare for that eventuality. Like right now I'm taking this one up to about five inches. It was a big dough. You can make these babies almost as big as you want. I sold man a, po a man a pocket pie crimper the other day. When I asked him what pocket pies he was making, he said he was making pierogies with it. Meanwhile, these things are hand-sized. So it would be a hand-sized pierogi. I had to admire his ambition. It's a really good idea. Yeah. I have made raviolis that were full plate size before, so I get it. Woo. Thank you, chef. We're done here at my place. If you want to look at the Already? screen. Ooh, oh, wow. Oh, oh, yes. Let me Delicious. hold on a second, Marlis. Let me put that on the spotlight view. I want to see it. This is oh, yum. Good job. That's nice. That's good looking. What she got going on? She's, she's got some good schnitzel and she did a mashed potato. She's she's not making the pierogi dough. So we did a mash on the side. It looks she, those mushrooms look she great. She flew off with great. the recipe. I love it though. It's going rogue. I love that speed, speed racer. It helps that my grandma owned a cafe. So I learned how to cook multiple things at once. <laughs> <laughs> Little so. multitasking. Well, yeah, and I'm a dispatcher too, so multitasking is my life, but. <laughs> well, it looks great. It turned out a great looking Jaeger schnitzel. <laughs> so you guys have a good night. I'm gonna go enjoy my dinner with my brother. Oh, you have too. fun. Yeah, send us a picture, okay? Email me a picture. <laughs> uh, what is your email? I'll put it in the chat here. Get back over to Zoom. I have been watching how you do the pierogi though, because I've not made those yet, but I have a Polish friend and she's promised to teach me um, outside of this class, so. All right, ladies and gentlemen, take a peek in your there oven at your schnitzel. If the edges of your schnitzel are darkening and you see a good bit of bubbling, turn the oven off and you can even leave it hanging open for a moment. go. I'm going to roll one more. Then we're going to get working on our mushroom sauce, mushroom gravy, what have you, same diff kind of thing. Putting the Jaeger in this schnitzel. All right, my dumplings this is the last one I'm going to roll for you here. We're going to move on. I wouldn't be surprised if some of you are ahead of me. I'm typically very slow when it comes to parceling things, <laughs> but I do like to be careful. Can't complain about these results. Oh, we have some boil. Yeah, our pot's really here. excited. It's just waiting for the dumplings to go in. It's waiting for that moment. So now that the water is boiling or should be boiling for you, you can salt it now. Always salt, um, how do I put this? Always salt your pot after it boils, because if you know anything about chemistry, a salted pot takes a lot longer to reach boil because of the activation energy required to get it to boil. Um, because of that, it'll take longer for you to get to a boil. And worse, if you're using a steel pot, if the salt doesn't dissolve right away, you'll get pits in the bottom of your steel pot because the salt sat on it too long. That's literally like what happens to our cars every winter. You'll, you'll start wearing away the finish on a stainless steel pot with salt that doesn't dissolve into the liquids. All right, it's enough for me right now. What we're gonna do is we're gonna pull forward this here small pot, has three tablespoons of butter in it and tiny little splashes of oil from our schnitzel. Which by the way, if you haven't checked, check on your schnitzel. If it's browning nicely and it looks rather dark, turn the oven off and leave the oven open. Because we're starting to darken on the edges of mine. I figured you guys might be getting there as well. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna grab a small cutting board. 
we'll get to work here on this sauce. Now, I've turned the pot here on. So it's beginning to melt my butter. I'm gonna use my, my rubber spatula here for moving that around. I'm gonna need a quarter cup of minced shallot or a half of a cup worth of finely diced onion of just about any color. The reason I specifically like to use shallots is because they are more intense in flavor. Just opening these, they've nearly filled the entire room with their odor. Um, I, I love shallot. It's like, it's like if onion had the intensity of garlic. Uh, and, and really and truly, you can use them as substitutions for each other because the shallot is so strong. If you have some shallot, no garlic, you don't have to cry about it. You could put garlic into the sauce. The reason I don't is because uh, Bavarians are known to use some garlic, but not very often and not very much. Um, frankly, that's more of a Mediterranean effect on food. And it really would just be a more onion and, and mushroom kind of feel to this. So now that my butter is melting, I'm just gonna take my shallot, dump it into that butter. And I'm gonna grab my mushrooms. I'm using cremonies. You can use any variety of mushroom in the world that you wish. When I say that, I mean it. Um, you can use things like morels or chanterelles. You can use sheep's head mushrooms. You can use chicken of the woods. You could use normal white button mushrooms. You could use enoki. You could use, I uh, probably wouldn't suggest enoki. They're better raw. But things like shiitake or um, oyster mushroom or woodier mushroom, they're all really great for making a sauce like this. I've already cleaned these off relatively well. You don't want to get your mushrooms wet. They're sponges. Anything you try to wash off the surface of water is literally going to travel inside. Um, and they're grown on compost and wood mulch. So you don't have to worry about that. There is a bit of a threat of botulism, but we're cooking these thoroughly. You won't have to worry about botulism. I mean, it's a bad way to get Botox, I guess, but canned <laughs> mushrooms are where botulism really does have issues. Um, not fresh mushrooms. Now, mushrooms, as I said, no water washing. You can lightly dampen a paper towel. That's just about it. And then you just brush off the excess dirt. Then I cut off just the bit of the tail that sticks out below the mushroom. And here's where you can cut this to any size you want. Uh, if you like a chunky mushroom, split it in half or quarter it. You can even leave them whole, but you'll have to take them out to make the gravy if you leave them whole. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to split the mushroom in half, and then once it's in half, I'm going to cut it three or four more times. Just like so. Moving those shallots around a little bit so they tender nicely in our hot butter. One side of my pot wants to be hotter than the other, so I'm going to scooch it. Now, as those shallots are beginning to tender, I'm just gonna throw in my mushrooms. Nice big baby bellas. They're more like toddler bellas at this point. Some people like to remove the gills from the bottoms of their bella mushrooms. The reason is because of intensity of color, very brown. However, I want the sauce to be brown. So I'm not removing the gills. The gills aren't removed for any purpose of being more flavorful or less flavorful just because of the color. If you were making a lighter sauce with these mushrooms, like a chicken-based sauce that you didn't want to turn brown, that's when you would come inside of here with a spoon and take all those lovely gills away. There we are. So we got all that into our pot. I'm gonna mix it around. We have to wait till our mushrooms begin to shrink a little before we can move on to the next part of introducing some flour. If you'd like to help them wilt, take a nice pinch of salt and add it now right onto your mushrooms. It'll help them sweat a little bit and will shrink up nicely for us. I'm gonna salt my water pot while I'm at it. Ooh, hot stuff. Ooh, I don't wanna fog up the camera. Think seawater. That's how much you wanna salt your water. 
whenever you are cooking pastas and things. That way your dishes don't lose flavor. I definitely lost my boil pretty fast once I got the salt in there, but that's to be expected. Close my oven up again. Getting somewhere. Mushrooms are starting to shrink a little bit. Definitely getting the smells over here, camera. Mm -hmm. That's really good. So I'm pretty sure you guys can see down here into this pot, the mushrooms are changing color slightly and beginning to shrivel up a little bit on us. It's just what we were waiting for. I'm gonna take about a quarter of a cup worth of my flour now. Assuming I can find where I put my quarter cup. Here we go. I'll use the, the spoon and level version. So the liquids are coming quite dramatically out of my mushrooms. Let's get my flour inside and stir it all up. Once the flour is in and mixed all around with our mushrooms, we're gonna wait about 30 seconds to a minute before beginning to apply liquids. We're gonna start with our wine. This is substitutable with beer or other, any variety of wine will do, be it Marsala or sherry will make a much stronger impression on your sauce and you'll get a Marsala sauce or a sherry and gar mushroom sauce. But if you choose to use a typical wine, make sure it's rather dry, not sweet. Sweet wines will not go well with this. And um, red or white will suffice, but they will change the color of your finished dish. There we go, getting the wine in there. It's breaking up all of that flour a little bit. And once that flour dissolves into the wine into a thick paste is when we're going to begin administering our stock. So get yourself some stock open right away if you don't have some already made or open. And then get yourself your first cup of stock inside of this here pot. What's a good dry wine you would actually recommend? Um, what I'm using right now is a Chardonnay. Uh, it's a particularly light Chardonnay, not too dark, not too oaky, not too bitter or anything. Um, however, uh, I would definitely recommend either sticking to, because if you don't want it to look like a bourguignon sauce, stick to whites and go with like Riesling, Chardonnay, um, a Chablis if it's, if it's off dry and not too sweet. Sauvignon Blanc, though I usually reserve Sauvignon Blanc specifically for chicken and fish dishes because it is light and tart and crisp and apple. Uh, Sauvignon Blanc would be okay. Definitely not Pinot Grigio though. You know, Grigio, we reserve that for the fish and chicken. So I got my first cup of stock inside. I'm gonna put in the second cup of stock when this begins to boil and thicken on me. You're gonna to have to move it around a little bit so it doesn't get too lumpy on you, because that can't occur. But it's not a bad time to hit it with a bit of seasoning. So right now I'm just going to use a touch of some ground rosemary. Ground rosemary is really strong. That was probably a quarter teaspoon. Don't use very much. Ooh, I think we lost a ring in there. Hmm? Oh my goodness, the rubber ring. It's okay, it's <laughs> silicone and heat resistant. Thank you for pointing that out. I might've needed that later. I was like, are we highlighting something? Are we? <laughs> it was a, a digital sure. effect. <laughs> I can't believe I missed that. <laughs> now, we're just getting to the point where I'm beginning to see this liquid thickening. 
Wait till you start seeing bubbles, then add your second cup of stock. Oh, sorry, second half cup of stock. It's about a cup and a half of stock and a half cup of wine. And my boil is pretty strong. I'm going to take my pierogies. I'm going to drop them in and set a timer for four minutes. Starting to see some bubbling on the edges of my sauce here. So now it's when I can add my second dose of stock, my extra half cup. Stir it around a little bit. Continue to ignore it for a moment. Now, in the event you've made a lot of pierogies, which you might have, you're going to have to stick to doing small amounts at a time, because as you can see, it takes away the boil very fast. Um, so don't put any more than about eight or so into a pot of this size at a time. And you're gonna have to fish them out using something like a skimmer or a slotted spoon to get them into the colander. Because if you dump out the pot, naturally you're gonna have to boil a whole other batch of water. So keep that in mind. If you slip this guy here into a bowl, like this, you now have something that you can hold in your hand and fish this out with and not worry about the dripping. Just a, a nice, like, easy way to get around having to go all the way to the sink with it. And the sauce is continuing to come up to temperature, I'm starting to see bubbles on the edge again. Now, we want to bring this sauce completely to a boil. So make sure that it boils nicely before you take it off the heat. If you take it off the heat too early, it'll break and it won't be thick anymore. It'll thin out faster and faster. Mm -hmm. So make sure this puppy gets to a good boil before you turn it off. It should probably boil for at least a minute. Not so much that it overflows the pot though. Keep an eye out for that. Uh, Bridget asks if the pierogies can be sauteed instead of boiled. They have to be boiled first. Then you oh. uh, can pull them out and then get a hot skillet ready with some butter sometimes some butter and onions or some butter and cabbage. Mm. And, then you boil, and then you cook them in that side of that skillet. Mm. Now, many of you probably noticed that I didn't put a recipe for sauteed cabbage on your sheet. That's because I forgot we're doing sauteed cabbage. <laughs> I apologize to everyone out there in TV land expecting me to saute some cabbage. However, it is really very simple. Throw a couple of tablespoons of butter in a pan and slice that cabbage down. There's a big core in the middle, so it's best if you split the whole thing in half first and try to pull that out. And then literally when the pan's nice and hot, you toss in that cabbage and stir it around with some salt and pepper till it tenders well enough to your liking. But keep in mind, it can caramelize. When it caramelizes, it's still delicious, but it doesn't taste as fresh. So if you want a fresh cabbage, sauteing it less is to your advantage. Adding touches of water can help keep it from caramelizing and litting it at some point will help it steam and soften. But it's really just a skillet, some butter, some cabbage and salt and pepper. No excuses here. I literally forgot what we were doing. <laughs> but however, we were very much engaged in our subject matter we here this evening. We were. <laughs> this is a dish. I'll tell you what. My pot here still hasn't gotten quite up to a boil, but I am confident it's at least at steaming temperatures. So it is still cooking. Uh, a, t a pot doesn't necessarily have to be rolling boiling to be cooking pasta. It only has to be about 180 degrees rather than the 212. So it's important to know that even in this state, this, this stuff is cooking. However, give it a little more. I can see those puffing up there. Yeah, they're puffing up and they're floating. Oh yes, and we're boiling quite nicely here on our sauce. So once it boils like this for another 30 seconds or so, I'm gonna kick it off. And that way we'll know that it's thick and appropriate left. And that timer here is for my pierogies. Since they didn't reach a boil yet, I'm gonna test before I decide to pull these puppies out. Quick test. The bite will definitely tell you whether or not this is a cooked noodle. That's definitely a cooked noodle. Yeah, she's done. So I'm gonna dump this. I'll just collect it this way.
because. Just like that. Now, if you're gonna fry them, first off, when they're cooling in this rack, try to move them around every so often so they don't stick to each other too badly. Uh, and let them kind of cool off a bit till the exteriors actually become kind of dry. They can't be wet before they end up going down into the skillet. So let them kind of steam their life away here a little bit, they'll lose some temperature. I'm gonna turn off my sauce. Definitely boiled enough. And what you'll want to do is taste your sauce because it might need a pinch more salt. This happens. Taste it for salt and a little pepper. Really and truly, that touch of rosemary should have been more than enough. I can smell it right through my mouth. Yes, I absolutely smell it. Let's get to plating this lovely creation. I'll clear away some area here. There we go. Hmm. Well, it would be nice if I had it. That's bad. I was looking around. I we need something to eat <laughs> you need off something of you actually plate on. There we go. Let's grab out my shit. I'm gonna do. Oh, nice and crisp. Oh yeah. Now these are rather big. Something that I actually love about them <laughs> is that they're huge. So usually giving somebody three isn't an offense. No, those are plate fillers. <laughs> How do you know your pierogi is done when it floats? How do we know the pierogi is done? Okay, so you can pull it out and taste it, but if it's been in boiling water for four minutes, that puppy's done. Put on a little bit of your schnitzel sauce, you can even put it over your pierogies if you wish. And grab yourself a little parsley if you want to be fancy with it to make it look a little more green and fun. And then we have Jäger schnitzel and pierogi, a cultural amalgamation of, of Polish and Bavarian cooking that just go really well together. Now I'm going to have Abby here eat it. All right, guys, let me take one for, for the team. I'll do this for all of you. <laughs> it looks delicious. Where should I start? Should I start with the pierogi or the schnitzel? It's up to you. Okay, I'm going pierogi. Either way, it's going to destroy your diet. Oh, I've been planning for this meal all day today. <laughs> Get some of the sauce on there, this lovely sauce. What do you think? Did, did we beat Mrs. T's? Okay, sure so technically, did. Because I'm Abby Twyford, any pierogi that I have is Mrs. T's pierogi. <laughs> but, but this is delicious. This is incredible. This is very, you can taste the homemade. Let's get to the schnitzel. Ooh, just cut it with a fork. So tender. Mm-hmm. It's got a nice crust to it. That's delicious. Nice and crusty. Yeah. Put some mushrooms on here. Mm. I didn't taste the sauce for salt yet, so hopefully it was salty enough. Oh, it's good. I'm gonna take this with me. <laughs> well, thanks everybody for joining us. Do we have any more questions? Is there anyone who's still lagging behind or having any difficulty with one of these, one of these recipes? How are we doing? Anybody wants to chime in, unmute yourself here. Some of you may be eating now. Might be too late. <laughs> hey, this is Lonnie. Oh. Hi. Uh, so curiosity. Um, some of my schnitzel, like, uh, well, the breading for the schnitzel has kind of fallen off. Um, did I do something wrong? <laughs> okay. So, whenever you were frying your schnitzel. It's possible that it got roughed up when you were flipping it. It's also possible that your skillet could have been just a little too cold. It tends to make the, the skin kind of release a little bit from the meat. 
You do have to be delicate with it because it's very, very thinly pounded thing. And also whenever you're making your coating, uh, sometimes you can make it just a little too thick. I mean, it's good to you know have a lot of zeal for it, but if you're really packing it in there, sometimes a lot of pressing can actually kind of shift the places where you need it to stick. And then it doesn't want to stick. But usually when it falls off for me, it's because I was just being too rough with it with the tongs. Like this piece right here was the last piece I put on the tray and I literally lifted it out of the pan sideways and put it into the oven. And that you can see right here. That's just because I was a little rough with it. If you use a spatula in the future instead of tongs, you may have an easier time with it. Um, and if you noticed at all that your cutlet began to curve on you, that's sometimes the reason why I end up getting my my coatings coming off is just that, that concave shell that it makes whenever the edge begins to curve. But if it stayed flat, it was likely just because it was a little rough handled with some tongs at a delicate moment, maybe when you were flipping it, turning it, or putting it onto the pan. Anybody else? Thank oh, you, Linda. Yes. So, hi. Hi. So, I am actually still cooking the pierogies, like they're boiling. So okay. would they always float to the top or should we time it like the four minutes or whatever? They usually float to the top in that time period, usually before that time period, they're already okay. floating. However, there's a potential for them to stick to the bottom of the pot. So a few moments after you drop them in the water, make sure you move them around with a spoon or a spatula or something, okay. just to make sure they're not sticking. Okay. But yeah, they usually float pretty fast, within like a couple of minutes. Okay. Okay. Probably taste. Anyone else? Yeah, Karen, you should get a taste in there. A little taste of my sauce here. Mm. I love wine and mushrooms. When the two come together. Yes. It really cleans up the mushroom. There's no mushroom I ever want to eat that doesn't have some form of alcohol that comes in contact with it. <laughs> and it's mostly because they're very rich, slightly ammoniated flavors. Those earthier flavors that they give off are just complemented super well with booze. Yeah, I can definitely taste the wine in there. It's, it's just right. It kicks it up to see Just that. right. Okay. Well, everyone. I do have another question. Yeah. So for those ones who want to saute them after they boil, like once they come out the boil, should we cool them a bit before we pop them in? Yes. Yeah. yeah. As I said earlier, you're going to want to let them cool till they're dry enough and cool enough to handle in your hands. Um, oh, if they okay. still have a lot of moisture on the exterior, let them just sit and dry for a moment. The okay. more moisture that's on the outside, the more they'll want to stick to that skillet when they, they, when they hit the hot oil. Make sure the, the, butter's, or the butter or oil is rather hot too before you start putting anything in. And mm -hmm. using a non-stick skillet over a cast iron will help you with the release moment. If you're using a cast iron, grab like a spatula with a flat edge so you can cleanly give them a flip because they'll want to stick like a pot sticker. Okay. And saute them till they brown on both sides. Perfect. Okay. I'll have to email you a picture, Abby, when or Yes, please, please. I see Jeremy's digging into one of his pierogies there. Awesome. Okay. Well, we will wrap things up for the evening. Um, go ahead and thank you all for being here tonight. Thank you for joining us. We are back next month on the 20th. I think so. I think the 20th. It's a Thursday night. We're back here and we're making tortilla española with bacon sofrito. Thank you for saying it because I never would have remembered it. <laughs> All right, guys. Thank you. We'll see you next time. Email me pictures and we'll see you. All right. Thank Bye. you.